Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your holy word. I thank you for your presence, Lord, and your consistent direction. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for being in the giving business to your people, encouraging us to go in the direction that we must go, causing our eyes to see the things of your kingdom and to remember your words of life. Draw us near your heart today, Lord, as we take a look at the things that are going to be happening. They're drawing near to the end, Lord. I pray that you'd raise up a generation of people who will see clearly. They will hear your word clearly. They will hear your voice clearly and declare it in a timely fashion, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'd have mercy upon us, Lord, as we listen to you, as we seek you, Lord. In this weary age, so many distractions and so many different challenges that come along and try to make us waste our time, make us waste your time, Lord. I pray that you'd help us to redeem the days, Lord. Redeem the time for the days are evil. Help us to be overcomers, Lord, by your light. Reconstruct us from the inside out, light, Lord, just by showing us who you really are, that we will have perspective, God, a grounding, rooted perspective in thy dear son rooted and grounded in the beloved lord all to the praise of your wonderful name may christ get the glory he deserves in this time in his precious name we do pray amen amen so tonight it's going to be along the same lines it's just something that is so passionate in my heart i have just a lot of just main things to look at not a certain text, not a certain anything. Just want to hang out in the Word and a few notes that I have as well on top of it. But for those that like a quick and thorough view of the pre-wrath rapture, tonight's your night. I'm going to give you a pretty nuts and bolts view of the four main things of eschatology tonight. And I want to keep on promoting this thing and keep on re I'm refining it. So nothing I'm saying today I've said before. I'm just sh sharpening it up. A couple of mistakes that I made and going to cl clarify those things as well to make sure we can get a, a, a clearer, sharper, refreshed view of the last days. And I'm getting more and more sure that it matters a lot. I feel like the enemy is trying to get people to not even think about it, not even to care about it, to think it really doesn't matter, even though Jesus mentions it dozens and dozens of times and talks about people being on the right side of it and on the wrong side of it. And I, I just can't for the life of me, understand how anybody could say that I'm a born again Christian, I'm on fire for Jesus, and yet I want to dismiss half the Bible for whatever reason. They've been told that it doesn't matter and such like that. Beloved brethren, body of Christ, good dear Christians, I tell you, it matters immensely, especially for those that are going to be going through it. We'll be looking at some of those ideas as well about how times when people were not on track with God, they lose track with God because the persecution was so much. And as I'm starting to embark more on the early church, I'm starting to realize that people, the, the, the language that they used last time, it was about a contest. We know it's a testing or a trial or a chance for us to, to, to overcome in the midst of indescribable adversity, where it will be so hard to hold on to your faith in some of the times coming. And for people to make light of that, I just, I simply cannot, I cannot get behind it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a breakdown of things I've been working on this week. We already know about the first half of the seven-year period. That's this. That's five of the six, or five of the seven seals. The sixth seal is when the rapture happens. We know that the Antichrist is in the middle. I have no idea how anybody can't see this when you just take a few verses. We're going to look at that too. So I, I kind of condensed it a little bit more so I could put more things in between the two arrows. But the Bible does mention the vengeance of God, which is mostly the end of it when he kind of completes his vengeance. But really all that is the vengeance of our God, the day of our, the day of his judgment. The harvest is the way that he describes it. This in the time of the harvest is the time of the end, the end of the world. That's what the, the end of the world is also called the harvest. So in between there, that would be considered the end of the world. All these things kind of are, but that's really where it all finalizes right there, where God is able to pour out his wrath upon all these people evil people in the world who don't care about him. They don't even let the thoughts of God retain in their mind at all. The vengeance of God, it's a harvest. It's the end of the world. The day of the Lord, which is, is judgment, severe, severe judgment, the worst that has ever been throughout world history. 
and it's also called the end of the world compared to the harvest when it was in a parable form. And parousia or parousia, however you want to call it, that is exclusively this very thing and not to be compared to earthly kings like we mentioned before. I'm going to say it more because I want to reinforce it because I, I'm, I'm adding to it, but I'm reinforcing some things as well. So we know the seven trumpets and the seven vials. We've talked about that tons of times. It's all these things is basically the exact same thing. There's different words of the same thing. These are the biblical words of the exact same time. The wrath of God, it's revealed against ungodliness, the hour of temptation, Jacob's trouble, and then the early church writers called it the, the contest. It's like he's preparing the soldiers of Christ for this last contest. It's a contesting to find out, will you pass this contest? If you pass it, you'll have to go through indescribable torture in order to get there. So he's saying this is a contest. We have to look at the verbiage of those who actually knew the, the, from the apostles themselves. So these early church writings, they're not God and they're not the word of God, but they sure do have a lot of merit. Um, there should be they, they should be looked at to find out some at least general terms, if not more precise terms, which we, which we will look at some of them. I'm going to show you what I'm looking at in the near future so you can kind of get where I'm going to see if I can prove this case even more thoroughly with actually looking at the text and not just saying, oh, the early church says this when they can't verify it at all. That is that 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 level of lie and deception is so radical among the pre-tribulation people. I am more and more convinced the more I look at this, the more I realize how much Satan doesn't want us to know the truth about this. And so as much as the fad today is, oh, we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to divide the hour of temptation that's coming upon the whole world, it says, and Jacob's trouble, which we don't know how long it's going to be because we don't know when the rapture is going to come. All of these things represent pretty much the same thing. And uh, the end of it would be the wine press of the wrath of God, the wine press when Christ comes on the white horse at the seventh vial. It's going to be a great hail. It'll be a great earthquake and it'll be Christ coming down. So of course, this is going to be horrifying. So at the rapture, there'll be a great earthquake and at the coming, when he comes back, there'll be another earthquake there. But there's no hail over here. There's no hail at the rapture, but there is hail over here. There's, there's a trumpet over here, no trumpet over here. There are angels over here, saints over here. This day we don't know, this day we do know. This day saints are going up away from the wrath, and this one they're coming back down to finalize the wrath. The difference between the two comings of Jesus Christ, which all represents the coming of the Lord. That's another one I forgot to put on there. The coming of the Lord is also fits inside of that. The day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, all those things matter for this part. So whenever they're saying we don't have to wonder what it is, it's mostly targeted in that one spot because it's going to be the most atrocious time on earth. And God could protect us on earth, in that time if he wanted to but he told us that he's going to take us to heaven that's why it says heaven and not to be confused with a wilderness it's nonsense so our earthly kingship we've said this before just getting warmed up before we get into the the timeline of all of it the pre-wrath and all that stuff so the triumphant entrance of a king is not a rescue it's not dangerous nobody's running for their lives and it's it's just people celebrating and throwing palm branches they're not running they're not scared they're just celebrating We've seen kings do this. That's not a big deal. That's not parousia. It's just a normal practice there. And yet they may have a trumpet. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's still not the same thing. In the rapture, he's rescuing people. And in the wrath, he's finalizing. Like we said, he's coming on the white horse. And we see it described in many different ways. Revelation 12, like, it, like the flood's coming and he's like an earthquake absorbing them all, killing them all that way. That's a parable. He's not really going to suck them in. I don't think he's really going to bring them into the ground. And also in Revelation 14, where it's, there's going to be the horses... The, well, it says that the blood will be up, for, up to the bright, bridle of the horses. And I was thinking that must mean the horses won't die, but they will die. So that's not true. I, I messed up on that too. So remember, we're going to look at four different sections of all of eschatology. The seven-year period, the consummation, the millennial reign, thousand-year millennial reign. And also we're going to look at the 10 or 11 things that are going to happen after that, which is what you see right here working on three different banners that I'm going to have physically in my hand. I already have the one that you can see on the top here. I have that one done. It's a three by six and they look really good with AI pictures and turned out pretty decent. You have to kind of give a little, you have to compromise on the pictures a little bit because AI only gives you what they want to give you. You can't be too choosy. They don't, they don't let you do whatever. They, they flag a lot of the stuff that you want to use, especially for the end times. But this is the seven year period. That's the first part of the four main things. And this is my favorite place to get, get really serious about because this is the part that we may be able to see 
So that's the seven year period and the consummation. And the next one that just showed up is the thousand year millennial reign, which you see happening on earth and you see things happening on, in hell. And that's the, that's the third part. And the fourth part is underneath there, all the things that are gonna happen or most of the things that are gonna happen after the thousand years. Seven year period, consummation, thousand year reign, and the 10 things that are gonna happen after that it was is pretty much the gist of the whole thing. You can get a screenshot of that if you'd like. And I'm going to be making banners of it too. So if anybody wants banners, you can have it like that too. You're going to need about six feet tall and at least 12 foot wide of a wall. And you can put them up and boy, it looks great. And it's, I'm going to go through them all tonight. So this is my favorite seven year period that I've made so far. And the great falling away, the first half of the seven year period, also known as the beginning of sorrows. The new versions call it birth pangs. And um, through here, you're going to see about five of the seals going through here. The five seals going off before the wrath happens. The seals don't represent the wrath. Those, the seven, 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 they're not all the same. They're all coming, they're, they're on, all in God's control, but some constitute as warnings and some constitute as wrath, just like the Lord has been throughout all history. He always sends warnings through prophets, pestilence, disease, and all the same thing he sends here, earthquakes and problems of all sort, ravishing women, whatever, and then eventually he sends the big whammo and slam them and that's when the wrath comes after the warning so when he brings his 777 it's no different he's going to have warnings and a lot of wrath it's going to be really hard so the great tribulation is this full second half but we won't be here for all of it so we're going to the rapture will happen after a lot of beheadings and there's going to be so many beheadings in such a short amount of time if christ doesn't rapture there will be nobody to, to rapture there'll be no flesh that will be saved then the the return of Jesus Christ happens after the seven year period, the wrath of God on earth. Okay. Some of the people who preach end times falsely, they can't, they, they mess up with the wrath of Satan, the wrath of God on earth, or the wrath of God eternally in, in the earth, in hell. And they try to mix them up as if they can't see the difference when clearly the context is super clear on every time it's brought up. So those things have to be clear. God gives tribulation to bad people. Satan gives tribulation to good people. That's the wrath of God against ungodly and the wrath of Satan against the godly. That's just how it works. They both have the same thing. So in a sense, you could call it a seven year wrath or the seven year tribulation, as long as you know that it's not coming all from one angle. It's, it's a war going back and forth and it's broken down into three different parts. Great falling away, great tribulation and the wrath of God on earth. It has lots of different names as we have seen. And then the consummation of all things, we've covered this. It's, it's the seven, the three, three stage cleansing that you see in Daniel 8, 14, and also Daniel chapter 12. The last three verses shows you the few, three different things that are going to happen after he comes back. Just like Josiah did, that's exactly how he's going to do it, except for Christ isn't going to be dying in Armageddon. He'll be doing the killing in Armageddon. So that's stage one and two. So let's look at stage three now. Okay, so this is almost the perfect setup that I wanted for the thousand year reign. You'll see the top left picture where there's a lion and an ox and a little kid, and it looks like a like a, a wolf and a big snake. And so this is kind of constituting for Isaiah 65, where it says the, gra the lion shall eat grass like the ox, but it's also unified with Isaiah 11, where it says the lion will be with the, the wolf will be with the lamb and the snake and the lion and the whatever, and then the child shall lead them. So that's kind of like a cross between Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 11. And then the next one over, you'll see Jesus Christ at the beginning, also in the thousand year reign with what, what he'll be doing in this time on earth. People in Isaiah, I think it's chapter three, when people from all over the world are going to come and hear him preach. And that will be for that whole thousand years. They're going to come all around the world to hear him speak. And the lion will be with the lamb and all that stuff. And everybody's going to hear him teach. And nobody's going to be afraid of animals because it's going to be different. That's Isaiah 13. I mean, excuse me, Isaiah 3. So Isaiah 65, Isaiah 3, and then the lion lies down with the lamb. That's Isaiah 11. And then the next one where you see Christ with the crown, he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. Isaiah 66 gives you the lowdown about that, where he's going to be ruling and rebuking many people because not everybody's going to be on track. There will be no war for the thousand year millennial reign. So that's the kind of peace we'll have. You see the soldiers behind them. They all have some type of a spear or some type of a sword, something tall like this. But the Bible says they're going to beat their swords into plowshares. It will be a no war for the whole time. Doesn't mean they're all going to be on track, but there will be no war. So they're, they're not going to have any swords, no spears. It'll only be for farming and just living and hearing Jesus teach. 
And a lot of people aren't going to get it all the way together right. So the lion represents Isaiah 65. Jesus preaching is Isaiah 3. The lion and the lamb is Isaiah 11. Christ is, pre Christ is ruling with a rod of iron. That is Isaiah 66. Now the next one is really, really my favorite special one where you see the two horses. They have bells on them underneath is how they would wear them, I, th I think, in, in Israel. And then the women who will cook, you know, how they cook with the, the, with the wheel and everything. And then they also cook with these seething pots. Zechariah 14 says, all the bells on horses and even the seething pots, everything will be holiness unto the Lord. The whole world will be glory. Every little thing, every little thing, the dust on your shoes will be holiness unto the Lord. It's basically kind of coming to that kind of a picture, I think. But it says bells and horses and seething pots. And so I make that one, and that's a good way to fall on your face and just worship the Lord. To think that He'll be, everything will be so powerfully real. Everything will be there to glorify God. And so much that the, that the lion won't even hurt you. And I was thinking, too, strangely enough, that if the lion is not going to be eating any meat it stands to reason that people won't be eating meat as well. I think everything will be like a vegetarian or something like that, or even vegan or whatever throughout that whole thing. As weird as that sounds, it does kind of make sense that if the lion's going to be eating veggies only, maybe we will be doing the same thing. Christ reigns on earth for a thousand years. It's marked with the angel coming from heaven. Or he takes a chain and he has a key in his hand and he takes the he takes Satan and he casts him into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. So he cannot deceive anymore. Okay, he's, it's, it, that's what I should say for the bottom part. Satan is bound and he will not deceive the nations anymore. Those are the things we really got to remember. And then when he, at the end of the thing, he comes and he gets loosed and he knows his time is short. Okay, so that's a good gist of the 1,000 year millennial reign of what's going to happen in it. And I, I, I believe that there will be a resurrection before, like we had seen, some to heaven and some not. So Satan's coming out. He's, his time is short, and that's what we're going to look at. But on the top, we also saw thrones, and those who ruled with Christ are the ones who avoided the mark of the beast, clearly indicating that the thousand-year reign is after the Antichrist. So anytime you want to debate about the timing of the thousand years and all that stuff. Just say, do you believe in the mark of the beast? And they'll say, yeah. Has it come yet? No. Well, these people avoided it because it's in our, it's the markers on our future and the mark is in their past. Clearly this is in the future. It hasn't happened yet. We have never seen the lion lie down with the lamb. We've never seen people come from all the world to go to Jerusalem, not new Jerusalem, not a heavenly Jerusalem, but an earthly Jerusalem to see him, to see him teach. So that's what's happening on there. There's a little bit more on the top that I had mentioned. And there could be a resurrection before and after. The resurrection thing is a little tricky still. We're going to read a little bit of that in a little while. But uh, in the bottom, we see him in Satan in here. And also the rest of the dead, they're also trapped here. And they're going to be judged later on. We'll see that in, in, in the next time here, the next thing that happens afterward. But Satan is loose. So let's remember that. That's the end of it. Now look at the arrow on the bottom. The one on the, the pointing to the left is supposed to say 70th week of Daniel, meaning it's happened before. And it says thousand years in the middle. And on the right, it says we're going to aim towards Gog and Magog because Gog and Magog has to be after the thousand years to have your doctrines actually right. So pre-wrath pre rapture, pre-millennial rapture, and Gog and Magog after the thousand years. You got that? We're right on the same target. All those things, super easy to prove just with a few questions. We're going to get to that later. So we're going to go over the, this fourth section this is the this is the third banner I'm making. So Satan is loose. He's coming out to he's coming out to meet the the armies of the world, and Satan deceives these people. The armies of all the world, so many you can't count them. They're called Gog and Magog, and Satan leads them to the valley of Hamongog. And when he gets to Hamongog, I believe that is the same valley called Armageddon, just a different name, because that's where they've always gathered to fight throughout Middle East throughout history. Fire comes down from heaven and destroys these armies, and then all the birds of the the birds of the sky come and they eat the bodies. And then, of course, God takes their souls by, with angels and throws them into hell. And then the weapons are burned for seven years and the bodies are being buried. The rest of what's left of the bodies are going to be buried for seven months. Okay, this is another cleansing they have to do to, to deal with the whole process. God has to cleanse it once and more. Satan was cast into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the beast are all already at. They were cast out before the thousand years. The sea gave up the dead. Now you got angels. I believe angels are going to be taking them out and bringing in them to judgment. Okay. When it comes to the sea gave up the dead, it doesn't sound too good for these people. When they get to the great white throne, it doesn't sound too good for these people. So I don't know. 
Uh, great white throne, I've always imagined it in heaven, but Matthew 25 makes me wonder if this is going to be a different type of, a, if it's going to be on earth and such. There's a, that's a big subject, we'll get into that another time. Satan is loosed, okay, he comes out of the ground after a thousand years in hell, and then he comes and deceives the nations. He gains all the armies of the world, they're called Gog and Magog, and they're headed to the valley of Hamangog. They get to the, they get to the valley, and they try to stop, they try to attack Jerusalem. And the Lord sends fire from heaven and destroys all the armies right then and there. Trying to give them their final warning. Get it through your head. Don't touch my people or I will kill you. That's what he's been saying throughout all world history. That law will never, ever fail away. It will never fade because of a promise that he made to Abraham. Through your family, through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Mess with them, I will mess with you. Bless them, I'll bless you. Curse them and I'll curse you. That's what he said. So the Supper of the Great God is the title that you see before the seven year, before the thousand years, but it happens all the time. God's always feeding the dead armies to the animals, birds and the wild animals of the field. So this is another another supper of the great God where the birds will come and eat all the dead bodies. So the seven year burning, the the, the weapons will be burned for seven years. Uh, sometime somehow they're gonna have weapons that'll be burnable and burying the bodies for seven months. And then Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. I don't know if all the people are going to be cast here together at the same time or because after death is judgment, the Bible says. So maybe those people who died at the army will be carried by angels into hell right then and there. That makes sense, too. The sea gave up the dead. People coming out of the ocean for some reason. I don't know why they're coming out of the sea and not the graves like we heard before. That's really interesting. Somehow there's, they're in the ocean. I don't know why. But that's where the, the Bible describes that. They're going to the great white throne to be judged. I don't know who. It, it looks like they're all going to have a bad time there. And they headed for the new heavens and the new earth. So that is kind of like the 11th thing I threw in there of the, all the things that are going to happen after the thousand years or the, some of the key things that will happen to give us perspective at least. 11 different things that are happening right there. So as far as this uh, thousand year reign goes, is pretty interesting thought for me thousand year reign thinking that there's a resurrection before the thousand years and a resurrection after the thousand years so let's look at it fresh in revelation chapter 20 the passage i'd like to read it says and i saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them not quite clear on what that is and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of jesus and for the word of god and which had not worshipped the beast, neither had neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So those who didn't take the mark, they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. It says, But the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So it looks like he's saying the first resurrection is having it says they didn't reign until after, until the thousand years were finished. That's the re first resurrection. So it looks like the first resurrection is after. But then it says here, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So that makes it look like that's happening before. So it looks like that those two those three ver two verses are showing the before and after. I don't know. I'm still, I, I, I understand it. I have it penciled in in my mind that it's happening before and after the thousand years. No problem. But in the, in the text, it still isn't clear to me. That's my weakest point of all my eschatology is, is that part. I had a few other ones and those are cleared up. This one's still not cleared up yet. So this is my little short message tonight. I wanted to give a few different things to help us co continue to stand for the pre-wrath rapture, pre-millennial rapture, and also that Gog and Magog is not coming now. I don't know why it matters. It's it's interesting how much the enemy is is putting out so many lies in order to pump this stuff out. One of the things I think happens when you have a pre-tribulation rapture idea instead of a Christian view of it, you have a chance for people to continue to day after day lie and lie and lie and lie and say, Jesus might be coming soon. Keep on buying my books. Keep on tuning in. Keep on supporting my ministry. It's all about money. Pre-tribulation rapture is, is such a lie. It's here to help people make money. And well-meaning people who are following people who are following, who, who are following the wrench that's been thrown in by Satan to our spokes of, our, of the truth of God. Satan threw a wrench into the spokes 
of the Word of God and the Church of God by pre-tribulation rapture. And I think well-meaning people have followed it because it just made sense to them somehow and they cannot get off of it somehow. So I'm not going to say everybody who's doing it is evil, but whoever's preaching it is preaching a doctrine that did mean to be evil to the church. It's It crept in unnoticed, but we can clearly see there's nothing to support it at all. I've heard the arguments and the more they talk, the more I just get more. I can't even believe that they won't stop talking because it makes no sense. Three things we need to stop all this nonsense right out of the gate. My question is, is the Olivet Discourse the rapture? If you get that one set, which it is the best, it's the best chapter in the Bible for the rapture, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and Luke 17, kind of. Those four things, make sure you always hear all four of them. Whenever you're verifying things, make sure you look at all four. I think it's the best chapters for the rapture. And if you can agree that that's the rapture, which is exactly what it says, then you will have a lot of ground for the when it comes to playing chess on the board with when you're trying to win people with this topic here, which I believe like Satan wants to preach it wrong because it's going to mess people up in the end. Seems like it doesn't matter last last generation, but the next generation, I promise you, it will matter eternally. This is a matter of life and death eternal because of the perspective it gives you and the way we respond to the word of God will not be with the urgency that we will need, prepping ourselves for the day we are going to get tortured beyond description. We need to know that that will happen if you want to go to heaven, if you happen to be unlucky enough to live through this time when the rapture actually happens. Is the Olivet Discourse the rapture? Yes, it is. I've heard people preach that it is the it is God establishing his kingdom when there's not one single word about that at all. You can clearly see that it's taking him up to heaven. How is he setting up his kingdom on earth when he's taking people to heaven? That makes no sense. Next question is, is Daniel's 70th week the seven-year period? I've heard pre-tribulation people say that they know that that seven-year period is the 70th week of Daniel, and the Bible says in the middle of it, you can see what happens. The Antichrist shows up in the middle of the 70th week, and then the Great Tribulation happens, and then the rapture happens. Same as the Didache that was written by the apostles. It was the Antichrist, it was the Great Tribulation, and then the rapture. Everywhere you look, it's the same exact thing. But then you read it, and then they'll go, oh, that proves the pre-tribulation rapture. And everybody says, oh, amen. Even though what they just said is exactly opposite of what you just read. My other question, to help clarify the pre-millennial position, has the mark of the beast come yet? The answer is no. It's still in our future. But to those who go through it, it's in their past. Meaning that it has to, the future, it has to be in the future. The rapture is going to come in our future, and that will be... After that, the, the millennial reign will happen. Those three things we need to have set so you can win every argument from there. And you can win the argument that the Gog and Magog is after the thousand years as well, because it shows that it is. It's clear. The doctrine of the thread, okay? Another thing we want to clarify, I know that some of these things sound like I'm just talking, but I'm telling you, when you hear all the arguments that are going on and the danger factor, I've never felt so, I've never felt so at risk for attacking a doctrine uh, when it comes to salvation or all kinds of other subjects it's amazing how fearless i am but when it comes to this i feel more scared with something that we're, we, we, we would brainwash to think that this one doesn't matter I'm like it matters a lot because i feel like i have more chance of being uh removed from existence from this than anything else i've ever done doctrine of the thread the question at the olivet discourse when the when the apostles were asking lord when is this going to happen and when are you coming to return? And when, what are the signs of your return? Those three questions, he's talking about 70 AD and something that's in our future. Something that is radically in our past and something that is in our near future. So why would those questions be? Just the question alone was already a thread. So people who say they don't believe in the thread, honey, it's, it's everywhere. People always talk like that constantly, especially in the prophet books. But even then, just normal. They just asked. They weren't even prophesying. They were just asking. And they were asking in thread form. And Jesus never answers the first question. That's the part that's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble with people thinking that Jesus would just ignore the question. He may have answered them, but in the Bible, it doesn't show him answering it because he starts talking and within a sentence or two, he's already talking about, but the end is not yet. So why was he talking about all the other stuff that, that goes along with that? It doesn't make sense. Everything he says is, is goes right along with Revelation chapter 6 goes right along. All that stuff has to happen. He's giving you step by step of what's going to happen. 
you got three main places in the in the Bible that some of the clearest texts of the rapture, math, it's all of a discourse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. The all of it discourse is for the steps towards the rapture, for seeing the steps so, so you can watch and wait clearly and count the number of the beast and all that stuff. You can check. And, the, and then the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4 is is teaching you the rapture in order to comfort one another, to let you know that your loved ones who've already gone on aren't going to miss the rapture. They're going to be going to the rapture first. They're going to be going to heaven before you. They're going to meet Jesus before you. And then the other one was about resurrection. And I believe resurrection is more about bodies being transformed from mortal bodies to immortal bodies, corrupt natural bodies to incorruptible bodies. That's more of a supernatural resurrection. People are being raised from the graves, no problem, but they're still coming from the grave. And we're all being changed into spirit bodies, whether in the grave or on the earth, either way. We're all going to go up and we're all going to be changed in an instant to be like him, a spirit body, not creator of the world, but a spirit body just like Jesus. That has to be quite clear. 70th week, the abomination is in the dead center. That's what the Bible says. Then the rapture happens after this. There's no question about this. So how people can get one thing and then skip it is because they don't believe all of the discourse is the rapture, even though it's the best rapture chapter in the entire Bible by bar none, because it says earth to heaven. You can see the passage in Matthew. It says from the four winds of the earth all the way to the heaven, something, something like this. It's even more, it says, it actually says earth in Mark 13, 27. So then when you compare the two, which is the exact same thing he's saying, he clarifies it further by saying earth to heaven. So I preach, yes, the rapture is true. It's an earth to heaven rapture, not to go and see the guy coming down with flaming fire and say, hi, could you take us back to heaven? Or we'll escort you, you know, however you're going to escort Jesus. I'd like to see people practice flying in the sky and pretending that Jesus is going to come and you're going to escort him back. You can't do that. You're going to have a jetpack in your grave and just pop out and grab him. It's absolutely ridiculous. There's no scripture for what they teach at all. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, there's no verses for this nonsense. The key figure outside of scripture before Jesus and one after. Before Jesus was on the scene, there was one, one leader in, in Greece. His name was Antiochus of Epiphanes. There's one key guy before Jesus, and then there was Tiberius of Rome that was after. That was the 70 AD thing. One was the abomination of desolation in the temple, which is Antiochus before, but the temple never fell then. Okay, And one was a full-scale war, and it was bad for Israel, and the temple was flattened. You cannot compare those two. I've even heard a really smart guy, I'm not going to name his name because I don't want anything bad about him said, but he's a smart guy, and he even tried to act like 70 AD was some abomination and all that stuff. I'm like, no, you're mixing the two key figures that aren't in the Bible, one before, one after Jesus. Don't mix them up. I always do the same thing, but, but don't do that because <laughs> you're going to get messed up and play in, start playing into the hands of these uh, false doctrines that we're trying to get them out of our way. I want people to be prepared. And that very preacher, Brother Poonin from India, great man of God, and uh, I don't count him as a very awesome eschatology preacher. I don't know. I'd have to listen to him more, but I do like what he said here. And he said it like when it comes to Cory Tim Boom, there's a lot of Christians who are facing tribulation and they let go of their faith because it got too hard. It's easier in times of trouble to let go of your faith, not knowing that that's a time of testing. People keep lying to you and giving you these comfortable gospels that are not keeping you prepared for the day you're going to have to be tested to have your faith be tested. Are you going to let go of your faith because someone's going to hurt you, torture you, put you in prison for year after year with hardly any food or do evil things to you? They're going to hurt your loved ones. They're going to do all these things. Will you, will you cave on your faith to save your loved ones? How much do you love Jesus? Is he Lord or not? And you're going to have to hold on to the very last second because there are people who have caved on the last second. Very, very scary. There was a New World Order movie I saw on Pure, Pure Flix. And it's really pop. No, it's actually a different channel. It's on YouTube. Anybody can watch it. Should watch it, though. And one of the main girls at the very end. Go ahead. I'm ruining the movie for you. But the main girl, because she was kind of compromised. I don't really care about the rules before she gets to, to before the end comes. And her own family turns her in. I mean, it was horrible. And she and by the end, they take her in there to try to convince her to take the mark before she gets her head chopped off. And she actually takes the mark. 
and caves. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. She wanted to save your life at the very end. Why was she thinking that? Because she had all this selfish nonsense that she's been getting her head full of from all the hip hypocrite preaching that's been going on way too long. And it matters a thousand times more than you think it does. And I want to say, God bless all the preachers who don't preach end times, but I want you to know you're doing an indescribable disservice to those you call your sheep. And you're going to be giving an answer to all the weakness in their hearts when they fail on the last day. Think it's okay for now because it puts money in your pocket and you have a nice full church. But you're gonna. there are people who really want to know the truth. And you're going to be giving an account to them, all preachers who don't preach Bible prophecy. And tell your people you're going to face indescribable hell on earth and it's not going to be easy at all. We're going to go from beautiful living to indescribable concentration camps beyond all your worst nightmares. It says it's going to be worse than anything we've ever heard of in all world history. And I've heard what happened to Rome, and that was horrifying. How we're not preparing people like that is a massive disservice to your church. And everybody who fails on that because of you, you're either going to lose your salvation, pastors, or you're going to be in a very low position in heaven at the very least for damning so many people. So we have only one abomination that fits, and this totally slaughters the pre-tribulation doctrine. The preacher people admit that the 70th week is the seven-year period, as they should, because it is. And the only thing that they have to fight with at this point is to make the best rapture chapter in the Bible something other than what it clearly says. They say that this is Christ setting up his kingdom on earth and the, that couldn't be... There's, I just looked at it again. There's nothing about that at all. It's step by step. The great tribulation, then the sun, the moon, stars goes dark, then Christ is in the sky. Powers of heaven are shaken. The angels take people to heaven. It has nothing to do with setting up a kingdom on earth. The devil is a liar. There's no excuse for this pre-tribulation trash. I, I'm still going to be going through five of the most important people in church history and look at their writings myself and bring you all the context I can find for all these people to overly prove to you that it, that the pre-tribulation rapture has never been taught hardly at all throughout world th throughout church history for almost 2,000 years. It was never even thought of. And I'm going to continue to prove it because this thing I can tell is a really big deal. For those that have ears to hear and you really want to be biblical, this is how you can be biblical. Stop saying things that the Bible is completely opposite on. They say that Christ is setting up his kingdom on earth. How in the world? Show me how that means that there's there's no that's not there's nothing to that at all. It's nonsense. Even though the text says he sends his angels to bring people to heaven, read it plainly, then in desperation mention that it says exactly opposite of what it says. That's exactly what they are doing. That comes the way what the Bible is. They go flip on the Bible and they completely flip on the early church writings as well. Because so far the early church is dead on with the Bible anyway. So, so far so good with the early church writings, what I've found. So I haven't found anything wrong with any of them yet. The army's gathering used to bother me, but not anymore. See, Jesus was talking to the disciples. He says, when you see the armies gathering towards Jerusalem, you can know that the abomination of desolation is about to happen. And when that happens, run from Judea. Why? Because it's 70 AD? No, because that's where the abomination and the image is going to be. That's why. And they said anybody there, because it'll eventually be around the world. But it's, that's where it's going to be. And some people will probably say, Brother Robbie, are you sure armies are going to gather around Jerusalem twice within the second half of the third, uh, second half of the seven year period? I'm saying, I don't think there's any reason to believe that they won't gather twice because the Bible says in the first half that there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That sounds like there's going to be at least two wars. And who else are they going to fight but Jerusalem? They've been, the, they've been the apple of the devil's eye as far as wanting to attack them all throughout world history. Who else are they going to fight against? So there's probably going to be a couple of attacks at least in the, in the first half of the seven years and at least two in the second half. That's not hard to believe at all. I used to think that was a messing up my stuff. doesn't mess me up anymore. I didn't even think about it, but it makes sense. Do I really think that there are armies would gather against more than once? Yes, I definitely, I know that they will. In the last seven years, yes. At least two times in the first and at least two times in the in the last. Matthew 25 is where you see the sheep and the goats before the throne of God. And it was really interesting. There's a really awesome tract called The Little Child Shall Lead Them. It's an apostolic faith tract, one of the one of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard. And in the vision that this girl had, it was seeing her dad going before the throne and he wasn't ready. And she said that there was smoke coming out of the ground 
and fire. And she said, the devil was waiting for people who were going to be rejected by Jesus. And I was thinking, how would there be cracks in the ground in heaven? But then I read Matthew 25 when it shows the part where it says he's coming down with his angels and he's going to judge all these people. I'm like coming down with his angels. I thought he was coming down with his saints. I don't get that. But it's really interesting how maybe the judgment will be on earth. I don't know. But it, it seems it looks like it says that. So either there's a thread there or I don't know, a thread to the later judgment in heaven. I don't know. But very interesting. Matthew 25, is these people on the, is the judgment going to be on this earth or is the judgment going to be in heaven? Is there a difference between the judgment seat of Christ in which we all shall face? Is it the same as the great white throne? That one, I've always thought they were the same, but it's, it's kind of hard to say because the great white throne, we see everybody looks like they're all going to hell. So like I said, uh, one thing I messed up on, horses did die. It says the flesh of captains and the flesh of uh, kings or whatever, and the flesh of horses. They were all being eaten by the birds. So Revelation 19 clearly says that. I, I messed up on that one. Um, there was another guy who I had picked on when I had 15 anti-rapture people. I, I picked on one guy. I'm not going to mention his name again, but he, he wasn't as bad as I thought he was. He admits that he doesn't know eschatology. He says he's looked at it. He says there's so much to account for. I don't know how anybody could know. That's that's a good way to say it. When you, haven't, when you don't feel good about it, you admit that you don't know. So I shouldn't be picking on him, but... Some of the things I said, he said that I know he said it was wrong that I rebuked, but uh, he said going into the air, maybe going into the spirit. It's not true, but he was picking. He said I was picking on people who were on Facebook who were a bunch of jerks on there and that I can understand. So now I understand the context of what he was replying to. So now I don't think he was so Ill illogical after all. And he was admitting he doesn't know, which is great. Another thing that the uh, the error people do, they preach the eschatology wrong. They, they they copy John MacArthur, who's got a lot of serious issues with eschatology, and, and, and then some. He says the church isn't even mentioned in Revelation after chapter 3. This is a very common thing people say. But the truth of the matter is, almost every chapter after that mentions saints. Not every one of them, but there, it says saints in like at least half of the rest of the chapter, uh, the, rest of the rest of the book. So how people say the church isn't mentioned because someone else said that, and then you look it up and realize, oh, it does say saints. My question to you, is not saints the same thing? <laughs> I mean, we've got the body of Christ, the, the sheep of his pasture, the lamb's wife, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the people of God. There's so many different names for Christians in the Bible. It doesn't have to say church. It could say bride of Christ, the body of Christ, whatever. There's so many different ways of describing his people. It doesn't have to say church. We don't have to have that exact word criteria like the Muslims always try to pin, pin us and say, where does, the, where does Jesus in the Bible say, I am God, worship me? And I'm like, he doesn't use those exact words, but he does say, I am that I am. He does say he, he is. Are you the son of the blessed, the Pharisees asked? And he said, I am. And that's not something you're supposed to say. Before Abraham... I am. He said, I am the son of God. I am the, the, I am a king. I am from above. I am the good shepherd that, that leads my sheep. I laid down my life for the sheep. He says, I am like 11 times in the Bible and made himself get killed for saying so. He doesn't have to say it the way the Muslims want to hear it. Amen. We don't have to have exact criteria for anything. We know what things mean and that's what we go by. Hallelujah. There's a clear, okay, hang on. Not a word of the rapture in the book of Revelation. That's what I, I, I didn't verify when the first guy I was kind of combating with, because he has a whole 11 minutes of anti-rapture material, and I slaughtered everything he said, because everything he said was an absolute lie, including this one, which I didn't catch before. He said, there's not a word of the, rep the rapture in the book of Revelation, not a word. And I said, what about the four verses that I found the last time I went through the 50 verses in the whole Bible? 48 in the New Testament and two in the Old Testament. That's just some of them. I went through as much as I could find, as fast as I could find it. Just happens to be 50. And four of them are in the book of Revelation. I didn't know it off the top of my head, so I didn't respond to it. But whether they were there or not, like I said, it doesn't matter. God can put words of rapture wherever he wants to. Just because you assume it would be in the Revelation doesn't mean it has to be. But just so happens that there were four. So I'll clarify, even more missing of the mark preaching from the anti-rapture community. Missed it again. Missed it again, folks. You've got to get it right. God doesn't, he doesn't preach all this. He didn't make this Bible for nothing. He made it for us to know. 
And there's a clear difference between the rapture and the return of Christ, the arrow going up and the arrow coming down. Clearly, they're going from earth to heaven. That's called rapture. And then coming back down with, with vengeance and, and raging fire, that's called return of Christ. What's the second coming? They both are. They both are the second coming. He's coming in the clouds and he's coming back to earth. But when he actually makes it to earth, that constitutes as the ad advent. Just because people saw him. Uh, I, I remember John saw him at Patmos. That wasn't the advent. Uh, Stephen saw him at the right hand of the Father. That wasn't the advent. John and Peter had fish with him on the beach. That wasn't the advent. But he showed himself, didn't he? After he even after he ascended, he was still showing himself. Clear difference between the rapture and the return of Christ. Clear difference. And they must be separate. The rapture is real. People are having rapture dreams and saying that we know that they're going to be escaping all this bad stuff that's going to happen. So I believe you. I believe you that you had a rapture dream and I'm not even going to deny that it was real. But you got to remember, there is wrath that comes from God and there's wrath that comes from Satan. If your rapture said we're going to be delivered from the wrath of Satan, I call your rapture an accident. It, you missed it. Something was wrong. It's not biblical. We're not going to be escaping the great tribulation. We will face the Antichrist. We will face the great tribulation, at least part of it. And then Christ will take us to heaven by angel, power of angels to heaven. I believe you, but we're not going to be escaping the wrath of Satan. We will be escaping the wrath of God. That's what it comes down to. Martyrdom is not always viewed as a bad thing. The disciples in the Bible were praising God that they were worthy to be beaten for his name's sake. And we're over there afraid of having any suffering for Christ. They thought it was awesome. They're like, we must be doing great because these evil people hate us. They proved it because they're beating us. They're clearly of the, the devil. They call it the crown of martyrdom. Throughout church history, it was called the crown of martyrdom, that you were considered worthy to be killed for Jesus. That's pretty cool. We're going to need to think like that because pretty soon we're going to have to suffer for Jesus and say, I get to suffer for Jesus? We don't want to be so worldly, like, well, we have all these things we want to continue doing on earth. Honey, we're all going to die. All they're going to do is bring our expiration date to an earlier date. That's it. <laughs> but we're all going to die anyway. Our time on earth is very short. We really believe this Bible. We're believing a God of eternity and his kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever. How would we ever want to put something on this wicked earth more above God in his will for our life when we could honor him and his kingdom I believe you that you had those rapture dreams, but if you said we're escaping the wrath of Satan, your dream was wrong, or you, you understood it wrong. You didn't understand the difference between the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God. We need to understand those things before you preach eschatology or interpret even dreams. I believe in dreams, and I think a lot of them are true. God bless you if you had some. The New World Order movie, it's like I said, the compromising girl, she lost it at the last moment. So don't tell me that this doesn't matter. It matters like I can't, I can't, I, I can't just tell you how much it means to me that you understand. We're going to face it, but we will be raptured partway through it. We're not going to face the entirety of it all. So my question to all those people who are familiar with early church writings, have you ever found something that says we will, we will face the entire three and a half years of the Great Tribulation? Or did it just say we will face him? I know we will. We will face the great tribulation. I know that's true. But does it say that we're going to go for the entire time anywhere in the early church writings? I'd be curious to find out. I don't think it's there. I haven't seen it yet. But people can lose it at the last time. People with Corey Ten Boom, like I said, they had they, they failed their faith because they thought that everything was going to be easy and it wasn't easy at all. They had this la 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 attitude. If they had been told the truth, they might have made it to heaven. Persecution is a testing ground. It is the final test to see if you will hold on to Jesus or not. Yes, you can lose your salvation, and yes, you must hold on to the truth until you are completely dead. There are some times when I wonder if God would allow a Christian to end their own life when they know that there's no other way. When it comes to this kind of time and you know it's time to go bye-bye, are you going to jump off a cliff to make it a lot easier on yourself? Or are you going to just, I don't know how God, this sounds really crazy because I know that suicide thing is a really touchy issue. I do not believe all suicide goes to hell. I don't believe that. I believe that Samson is the best example in the scripture because he was in a time of great disaster. And he said, Lord, give me the strength again and let me die with the Philistines. And he pushes them down and he dies on his own strength and God's strength, on his own will and the strength of God. gave God gave him the strength to, to kill himself. That's what happened. And Perpetua also took the sword and slashed her own neck. 
So I don't believe all suicide leads to hell. I don't believe it. I believe that in times of peace versus a time of war, a time of peace is different. That that would stand to reason that a lot of that stuff would, would constitute for murdering yourself. That's a different thing. But even then, I still wonder if there is a certain angle where God says, that doesn't count as murder because of the, the situation. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion there. But when it comes to war, that's a different situation. I don't I don't know everything about it, but I do know that I've seen stuff happen among people of God in situations that we haven't faced. We've been living in such a pampered age. We 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 think we know and we don't know everything. The rules change from time of peace to the time of war. David wrote his psalms in the time of war, and he was always saying, Lord, destroy my enemies, and he was right to say so. But in a time of peace, Solomon was reigning as a king in a time of peace, and he was not allowed to. He was, he was actually blessed with so much wisdom and so much wealth, more than anybody in the world history, because he didn't wish bad against his enemies. God does not want us to wish bad against our enemies. Think about the people who have done you the most wrong, and God says, I want you to release them to me. Every time it comes to your mind, makes your emotions angry, and you want to see them bad happen to them, God says, I want you to trust me and give it to me. I want you to bless those who cursed you and spitefully used you. People who purposely did wrong to you. It wasn't even accidental. It was, it was purposely hurting you and doing bad to you, injustice to you. Uh, and God says, I believe you that they did. I know that they did. And now I'm telling you, I want you to trust me and let them go. Let them all go. Don't wish bad upon your enemies. It will, it will, it will mess up all my plans I have for you, dear child. Let them go. If we don't let them go, we get the root of bitterness. We didn't get what we deserve, Lord. It will put a root of bitterness in our heart. It will, it will coil of our heart and make it very difficult for God to do what he wants to do. It will shut you off of every great thing that God wants to do. Just kind of hanging in there and all this. That's not what God wants. He's got better for us than that. Persecution is a testing ground. I tell you the truth. Eschatology matters. There's not a single verse in the Bible or a notion from the word of God that would indicate anything other than that. The case I've shown you tonight and the last couple times I've showed the word there's no way you could get around this stuff. I've heard the arguments even further. I've been going over it and over it, listening to the arguments of some of the most famous people in the world and seeing some of, they're pretty smart. And they, they say something that I hadn't thought about before. I'll put it onto my arsenal and make sure I can fit it in and be legit. I, I made a couple mistakes. I overjudged someone the wrong way. And then I also said the horses didn't die when they clearly did. I messed up on that one. But other than that, I believe this is solid and I believe it matters a lot. So look forward to seeing some more early church. I can't remember all the names of the dudes. Irenaeus, he's got a book called Against Heresies. I think it's chapter five and it is a huge chapter. So that's going to take me a minute to get used to that one. I like to go over things and really visualize. It takes me a long time to go through stuff. I'm slow, but when I get it, I get it. And uh, I'm going to learn his Against Heresies book when it comes to eschatology. So praise God. That's it for now. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. We'll conclude the evening with communion and song. Praise your name, Heavenly Father. We love you. Glorify you, Lord. Have mercy upon our souls, Lord. Let us be genuine vessels of honor by your spirit, Lord, to be able to birth reality of your kingdom through us into the eyes and the hearts of others surrounding us. Those that do believe, those that did believe, those that never believed, Lord. I pray that we would be a living witness, dear Heavenly Father, incandescent lights in this world, salt and light in this world to shine your kingdom's light, Lord, to many a souls. Let us be a witness to this nation, Lord. Let our life count for your glory, Lord. Let our lives count for your power and your kingdom, Lord, and your will and your blessing, dear Heavenly Father, that your name be glorified among the nations, Lord God. For those that are that have ears to hear, those that are not adverse against your gospel, but those that are available for your gospel, Lord, I pray for divine appointments, Lord, that people would find our YouTube pages. They would find the tracks that we've left behind. They would find our prayers, uh, allowing angels to minister to them and protect them and guide them to a place where they can really know the word and they can truly hear your voice, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to win the souls. Help us to win this community. Help us to win this nation, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to win our state that we live in, Lord. When the enemy is coming in like a flood, Lord, I pray that you'd lift up a standard against it, Lord 
to stop the works of the devil in Jesus' name. Send your angels, Lord, to stop the works of the devil right now in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, for those that are feeling downcast and downtrodden, Lord, that they would know that there is a hope in heaven that is, his name is Jesus Christ that has the right answer that will flood their soul with life and divine purpose and encouragement to overcome every obstacle that this world can ever throw. We know that your dear son had to face things unfairly, Lord, and I pray that we would learn to respond like, like he did. He opened not his mouth. Help us to be like Jesus with our hearts. Help us to love one another like Jesus loves everybody. Help us to love the brethren, Lord, even if they preach in wrong, preaching things that came from the adversary, Lord. Help us to love one another and be the lights even among your church. Bind us together in Christian love. And thank you for the strength of the believers, Lord. And please touch those that are their bodies are not doing well. Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd heal bodies, restore health, and, and give them a, a confidence that, that could never be described from something that's on this earth because it came from your hand, Lord. It, it came from your breath, Lord. Breathe upon the sick, Lord. Breathe upon the weary, Lord. Breathe upon them with your spirit and give them a new life, Lord, of your kingdom, Lord. In Christ's mighty name we do pray. Amen. A rock of offense. And Jesus is a rock of offense. Hallelujah. The stone which the builders disallowed is made a rock of offense. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 7 through 8 is a stone of stumbling. People stumble at the word. It's a precious stone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Not to everybody, but to some he is. The Jewish nation is an illustration of our of our theme. Every possible effort was made by Christ to win his own people to himself, but they would not have him. What a blow has fallen upon them, driven from pillar to post, peeled, robbed, persecuted, killed. Their desire has been granted. Let his blood be upon us, upon our children. How will it be in the future? See Revelation 6, 15 through 16. How can it be that a loving crucified Lord should become to so many a rock of offense instead of the chief cornerstone? Our Lord, keep our feet on the rock in our hearts, loving thee. Amen. Oh, man. How can it be? How can it be that our loving crucified Lord should be come to so many a rock of offense instead of a chief cornerstone amen that's what it says to those that love god he is a cornerstone he is your rock you, you can't live without him you would rather die than deny him because you love him so much but then he is to some he's a rock of offense because he comes against your selfishness people who want to live for the glory of god and to prefer others above themselves they'll never be depressed they'll never be wishing god's truth wasn't around they'll, they'll agree with the truth lord you're right i want to follow your truth i want your best for my life i want my best my life to be the best for you but it says for those that believe he is a cornerstone to them that believe and he's also a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling to them that stumble at his word and they rebel they disobey when we believe in Jesus, we are obeying him. If we don't obey him, then we're then he is a rock of offense. It's really scary to see a Christian style of understanding where we can be rebellious and still call him our cornerstone. Get it all mixed up. Let's unmix this. And we take communion today. Let's unmix it, Lord. Not only are you my cornerstone, but I'm gonna believe in you. So you can be my supernatural cornerstone. I don't want to stumble at your word. When I find something that says against my selfishness, I'm going to agree with you and deny myself. Take up my cross and crucify that part of me that doesn't want to obey you. And I'm going to die to that person, that part of me daily. I will not let that selfishness rule in my heart. But your, your holiness will reign in my heart. The bells and horses and, and seething pots will be all for holiness unto the Lord all over the world. And let me be a part of that. Let, let, my, let my heart be the bells on horses. Let my heart be the seething pots that would say everything is the holiness unto the Lord. The pursuit of joy. Men have pursued joy in every avenue imaginable. Some have successfully found it while others have not. Here are a few examples to describe where joy cannot be found. 
It's not found in unbelief. Voltaire was an infidel of the most pr pronounced type. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. It didn't, he, didn't, he didn't like his life and he was an unbeliever, amen, Voltaire. Not in pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure. If anyone did, he wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. Not in money. Jay Gold, the American millionaire, had plenty of that. When dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. Not in position and fame. Lord Beaconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both. Youth is a mistake. Manhood is a struggle. Old age is a regret. Didn't matter. Fame did not do anything for him. Not in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. Having done so, he wept in his tent before he said, There are no more worlds to conquer. Where then is real joy found? The answer is simple, in Christ alone. The world always thinks they know because they found something that works a little bit here and there, but they don't realize that joy cometh from God. You want to be happy in your life before you want to get your joy from God? Do you know how far your heart will drift from the true God? The only way you can have joy from God is if you care that God loves everybody, not just yourself. It's imperative that we know that God loves us. But at the same time, we're not the only us on the planet. We have to know that God cares about everybody. And if we don't even love our neighbor to wish good upon them, we're never going to have the love of God in our heart. He will never be able to reach us because our heart doesn't match his heart. His heart cares about everybody. He even reigns upon the just and the unjust. If we don't care about the unjust, even though those that have hurt us, we have to want good for those that have hurt us people that we are doing bad, people who are preaching wrong, people who are not even trying to preach. They're just living like fools. Do we wish good for them? Do we want good to happen to them? Or are we going to have a heart that goes away from the ways of God? God reigns upon them good. We're supposed to do good to them. We're supposed to forgive one another and, and encourage them with our life in Christ. We've found something that is much, much greater, of much greater value than all these things that you think matter so much. You thought rich and power and prestige was going to make you happy? You're going to die miserable like all the others did. They, they're not happy because you were not made to be happy outside of the joy of God being your basis. Happy is the man who puts his confidence in God. doesn't matter what the world says. doesn't matter what the world gives you. You can find something that gets you for a while. Oh, this is great. I found everything I need. I don't need God anymore. I promise you that will not always be. And you're going to get so caught up in things, so entangled in everything, you're not going to find a way out and you're going to be trapped forever. That, that final door will be shut and your life will belong to Satan and you'll be in hell forever because you didn't love your neighbor and you didn't love God the way he deserves to be loved. We cannot love God unless we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. We cannot love God unless we renew our minds because our, our natural mind is full of gar garbage. It'll always go the wrong direction. Give us a false presentation of Jesus, if, if at all about Jesus. We want, God wants us to be happy, but he wants our happiness to be built upon the rock. He wants us to be built upon the joy from the God who cares about everybody. We have to agree with God in, in his understandings of his kingdom. And then joy will start to begin, it's, it'll start to spark. You know, like anything you ever wanna do. I watched a video about a, a, a little kid. When he was seven years old, he was learning how to do the ski jumps. When he was seven years old, he can jump like seven meters. Or in, uh, not even on snow, it was like fake snow. When he was eight years old, he went in, uh, to about 20 meters. When he got another year, he was another 10 or so meters, and he kept getting further and further. And by the time he was 27, from seven to 27 years old, he went from jumping seven meters to 279 meters. And it was a world record. Why? Because he trained and trained and trained and got so used to it and flying through the air, going so long in the air, just in the air going fast as fast can be and not even worried about because he's so used to it and that's what god says i want you to be like this i want you to train from when you're young so it's, you're so used to the voice of the holy spirit that we want to be trained in this all the way but let's take that today and check and see if the lord wants us to help agree with him in ways and refresh our refresh our ways in that and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. It says, by, our, by his stripes that we are healed. Amen. And after the same manner also, he took the cup. 
when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye oft, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord, for the, the table of the Lord. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for your kingdom language to help put language to our own understanding. Oh, that we may learn to walk with you, glorify you, be a part of your kingdom, be a part of your, your people, be a salt and light in this world and declaring your glories among the heathen, Lord. You've given the heathen to us for our inheritance, Lord. I pray that we would take it, Lord, and make much of furthering your gospel and advancing your kingdom, Lord. Help us to love one another, Lord, as you have loved the church. Help us to prefer one another above ourselves, Lord, as you have laid down your life for your people. You came as a humble servant, Lord. Help us to be like Jesus in our own heart, Heavenly Father. In his powerful name we do pray tonight. Amen. June 24 to 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you, mighty God, for tonight. Thank you for your mighty word, grounding us, deepening us in your Savior unto us, Lord. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the freedom that you have given to us, Lord. Put our new names in the new, in the new Jerusalem, Lord. Keep us until the last day, our Heavenly Father. Be with us as we walk towards you. In your Savior's name we pray. Amen.